Okay, so do you want to move on to some questions? Yeah, yeah. I guess this is kind of like the Q&A part, guys. So anything goes here. Um, I know uh, Neil, Neil McDonald had the one question about, uh, bear with me. I've got Neil's question here. Had Neil's question here. Uh, there was a question. Was he, uh, did he ask about the, um, why we do modules with class? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So the question is, is why uh, do uh, some manufacturers or a lot of manufacturers uh, buy a class D module instead of building something proprietary, something that's, that's built and designed at the company itself. So for instance, for PS audio, it's why do we not build and design our own class D output stage? Um, so there's, there's various reasons for this. And of course at class A, we were doing this very thing. And so I'm actually, I do think that I'm a good person to ask this question to, cause I've been, involved in design teams that have tackled uh, um, you know, the problem both ways. Uh, so one of the issues, one of the large issues of, of, of building and designing your own class D amplifier that's gonna be ready for market is that there are a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, conformance aspects to a switch mode power, uh, switch mode power supply and a switching uh, amplifier design. So one of those is EMC um, or EM EMI, so electromagnetic interference. And you must be able to comply to the standards of, of that radiation, uh, RF radiation that the amplifier is emitting. And getting that design right takes, uh, takes a lot of time um, where you're just focusing on getting through that test alone. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of board spins involved in that, a lot of uh, general R&D involved in the safety and this RF conformity. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of R&D effort for perhaps a worse Class D amplifier. That's... <laughs> That's, that's basically what it is. And, you know, at, at uh, Hypex and, and Ice Power, for instance, they have many people, probably the size of PS Audio's team alone, that are Class D specialists that know a lot more about Class D than, than uh, people like me. So um, they're more qualified in making a more cutting edge design and they have more R&D and more research uh, um, capabilities to uh, design something that is cutting edge. And then they sell that to tons of, you know, professional audio companies like P for PAs and for um, inboard consoles and, and powered speakers. And then we get to reap the benefits of the purchasing power there. And uh, those designs have a lot of parts and a small company like us, it would take a lot more money to build, design, you know, and, and manufacture that bore for possibly uh, a situation uh, or a performance that would be actually less. So that's why a lot of companies do it. And having gone through my experience with Class A, I'll say that it's, um, you know, we probably should have just gone, uh, <laughs> gone with yeah. the off the shelf modules in that case. But uh, but you know, uh, they were fine amplifiers. It was just a lot of R and D effort for right. something that was probably on the same level of, of what, uh, what these companies are putting out. And now, you, you know, now like the latest modules, like the ice power edge module is just fantastic. It's just really, really good. So, you know, you can kind of, you can take their out, their input stages out of the equation and try to voice it towards, you know, what you want it to sound like, but the actual performance and the technical performance of that amplifier is, um, it's going to be really hard to beat those designs because they have a lot of R&D effort into it. Um, oh, what's your background in electronics design? Uh, so my education is from uh, University of North Carolina at Charlotte 
and I got a uh, double E uh, degree, um, microelectronics, uh, studying op amps uh, and uh, amplifiers. Um, and uh, that was really my focus there. I was, I was, that was kind of a, I was uh, an oddball because most people were in big power or they were into processors and uh, computer hardware. And then you have me, I was like building audio amps and stuff and they were like, that's weird. <laughs> but uh, I, I, was, I was the same thing. Everybody says, why are you going into RF electronics? Why don't you go into industrial, go where the money is, right? You know, I said, no, I want to go to where I, what I want to do, not where the money is. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 uh, my professor for electronics actually was 20 years uh, at Texas Instruments in uh, analog design. And so we, we clicked. And I remember the day that um, we were talking about frequency response and high frequency performance in amplifiers. And, uh, and I, uh, he, he, he told us, so, you know, you put these one microfarad electrolytic capacitors for your coupling caps. And I raised my hand. I said, I said, no, 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 no. Use a film cap, man. It's way better for, for RF than a electrolytic. And he goes, that's not true. All caps are the same. And, and at that point, I was just like, all right, all right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he knows I'm an audio nut. Um, so uh, what, what do you think the next uh, big difference to be expected in audio? Um, uh, or what is now just coming on stream? Um, so I, I take that as, um, you know, what's the big, new big technology? Is, is that what you, you mean by that? Right, um, who, who asked the question there? Uh, oh, Richard. Um, I think he was looking for, uh, you know, is it gonna be streamers or what? what's kind of the next big trend? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah, streaming and, you know, trying to, uh, well, streaming is the is the trend um, right now, and you know that is the future, um, and it is the now. Uh, you know, it is an amazing thing, and and I think that um, you know how that will progress is that streaming applications will sound better, um, and we're seeing that uh, going from you know we had Spotify, and then they moved on to title. Title is the big one that audio files. Oh, have, you don't have title? Like you're listening to Spotify, you need title. And then it was Cobas, and now Cobas, it's like, well, you're listening to Tidal, you need to listen to Cobas. <laughs> so I think that they'll, you know, I think that the evolution for streaming is actually a software evolution. And, you know, and we're having the players as well, but it seems that on the streaming side of stuff, the stuff that's really making a huge difference is the actual source of the streaming and how the company processes that information. Um, some people are into MQA, and I've heard title MQA sound really, really fantastic. Um, Cobuzz, the high res uh, streaming of Cobuzz is a is a giant leap compared to listening to Spotify. So, you know, I think that I think that the um, the streaming apps are are really what's progressing the quality of streaming. But you know, you also have the hardware that's doing that as well, and we all know. You know, it's very temperamental how you connect these devices, um, what input is going into your DAC, um, how all that's configured is, is critical to building a really nice digital system. But, um, but I do think that some of the biggest differences right now and the biggest advances is on the streaming application side of things. So I, I look forward to that, you know, progressing more. Um, do you strive for, for uh, minimalist when designing circuits? Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are areas in circuits where um, building something that's simple is important, but then there's areas in the circuit where building something complex is very advantageous. Um, power supplies, uh, simple power supplies have problems. Um, they're noisy. Uh, they have usually regulation issues. Um, 
So power supply design uh, can be complex and you want something that is intrinsically uh, uh, regulated, something that is uh, very quiet, that doesn't have a lot of noise, and something that is very isolated from external noise. Um, so in the, in the case of power supplies, I'd say that my power supplies are actually fairly complex. Um, they're done in a certain way and they have, they have some um, similar uh, characteristics about them that I try to keep the same. Um, that might be fairly unique, uh, not new, but just unique. Uh, but the signal path can certainly be simple and tubes are very linear and actually uh, uh, really thrive in this environment of, of having a simple signal path. Uh, transistors, on the other hand, are much harder to have a, have a simple transistor circuit um, because tr a lot of transistors aren't very linear, especially at voltages that transistors run at. And that's where the op amp was born where what you do is you, you rake up a bunch of open loop gain using transistors. And because uh, that the input parasitics to those transistors like capacitance and, and phase shift is so low, you can, you can have multiple stages and a lot of gain and then have a stable system with a lot of feedback. And that's how you get the linearity with, with transistors. Tubes, um, if you tried that level of of feedback with tubes, it would likely oscillate because you would have coupling, likely you would have uh, capacitor coupling in those stages and you would introduce phase shift shifts and parasitics where you would have maybe low frequency or high frequency instability. So you don't really see really high feedback circuits with tubes. And that's partially because of the instability problem and also because they don't need it. Um, they're already very linear and they don't produce a whole lot of distortion um, compared to a, a single transistor. Um, now, on the other hand, you can group all those transistors together and then you can beat the performance of the tube um, by having you know, high amounts of feedback around all that. Uh, are, are the new Chinese tubes as good as they claim? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was easy. Yeah, not at all. Not even close. Uh, someone said, unless you're Nelson Pass. That, that's believable. I don't know what that was referring to. But <laughs> that was referring to using... Uh, ICs that aren't available anymore. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm again. I'm not. Uh, I'm not opposed to that. Um, that's great. And I think that Nelson Pass has real reasons. Again, why he's using the the VFETs again. They're um, they have a triode curve instead of a pentode curve. That's very unique to that device. And you can't find that unless you use a tube. And um, I'm not a big fan of output state, uh, out power tubes. Um, I like the way they sound, but I don't know if I want to manufacture a, a tube amp, <laughs> a tube power amp. Um, okay, uh, the next one is, can you explain how the output filtering on the Class D design impacts the linearity of the amp's frequency response into various loads? So this is like eight ohm, eight ohms versus the four ohms. Um, can a class D amp be designed to be load agnostic in this respect? Okay, so uh, on the output of a class D amplifier, you have a low pass filter. Uh, this low pass filter is usually, it consists of a, an inductor and a capacitor. That's the most simple uh, low pass filter on the output stage of a class D. Uh, the problem with this is that at high frequency, that impedance is going to start rising. And so your output impedance looking from the output of the amplifier back in is going to rise with frequency. The problem with that is that the amplifier is gonna stop 
performing like a perfect voltage source or a less ideal voltage source. And the, the uh, ability for the amplifier to output current at high frequency is going to go down. And so what you, what you now have is essentially a voltage divider where the frequency response is going to either peak or it's going to drop. And so as you change that load, so if I'm in eight ohms, for instance, you might get a little bit of peaking in eight ohms and then go to four ohms and, and it might dip a little bit and you might be you know, a dB down at 20 kilohertz. And then you go to the eight ohms and you might be 0.5 dB up at, at 20K. So what that shows is a dependence on the loading depending or de dependence on load. So it's a frequency dependence issue. Um, so there are ways to fix this. And the, the big uh, solution that uh, designers use is feedback. So you use, so you have feedback after the filter and now that lowers the overall impedance across the, across the board. And now you have less uh, variation and less uh, dependence on the, uh, on the load. And um, looking into a speaker, this whole issue gets worse because then you get a reactance where instead of just a simple uh, peaking or a simple roll off, you'll actually get a really weird response due to the speaker's reactance. Um, the fact that it's, it's the, the impedance is swinging on the speaker. So you don't just get a, a clean roll off or a clean peak. You get a, usually like a squiggle. And John Atkinson will, will actually measure it on a reactive load um, in stereophile. So you can see the amps uh, under a reactive load and see what their dependence is and, um, and how, you know, how independent they are to the load. And so the one that varies uh, the least will be a better design. Uh, class Ds, this is a huge, huge thing with Class D. And uh, it's the crux. It's a great question. Um, and, uh, and they're just getting better. That's all I have to say. And it's through feedback. Um, what direction do you feel PS Audio must go to expose the 20 somethings to, to what good sound is? Um, hmm, it's, it, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that a lot of people are very interested in sound, very fascinated with sound. Um, a lot of younger people are, are completely fascinated. Um, it's just way outside of their budget. So to answer your question, it would be that, you know, we would have to strive to push to make affordable gear um, because they're, they're going to try to, you know, buy stuff, but it's just that, a six thousand dollar amplifier is not something that's that's um, maybe it's within their means. Maybe they can afford it, but they're not willing to to buy a six thousand dollar amp because who wants to buy a six thousand dollar amp for their first amp that they've ever owned? Uh, you know, you kind of want to dip your foot in first and just kind of test the water. Then you kind of develop the ear. Then you get the fascination with starting to build a system and trying to make something synergetic. Syn synergistic with what you what you like so um to answer your question i think it would be that we need to keep driving products down in price and just keep value at a at a um a very core uh part of what we what we do um and we have many people in the company that feel very passionate about that and uh stellar is to give the taste of, of high performance at a value and then sprout is is absolute value and integrated at seven hundred dollars um, that can be paired with like you know a thousand dollar bookshelf like a kef ls50 is a nice one for that um, so you know there are affordable systems to dip into the high-end world and uh, i think for younger people it's not a question are they interested it's just a question of please make it affordable because i don't want to spend even if they can I don't want to spend a lot of money. Definitely. Um, 
does class D benefit from a linear power supply? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'd have to say that I haven't actually compared the two with the same amp. I've listened to amplifiers, class D amplifiers that have linear power supplies, and I've listened to class D amplifiers with uh, switch mode power supplies, but they were different output stages, so it's kind of hard to, I can't really make a parallel there. Um, I've listened to uh, linear amplifiers with, with switch mode power supplies and linear amplifiers, the same linear amplifier with a, with a, um, with a, uh, a linear amplifier a linear power supply. And that's a rare situation. Not many people get to hear that. And I'll say that the linear was uh, vastly more superior um, in, in being able to uh, have really low noise floor, something that sounded like it had less um, uh, intermodulation. Uh, it just sounded cleaner and, and had uh, much uh, better low end uh, response to it. So, um, you know, again, I'm not willing to generalize in that specific situation. I'm sure that a switch mode power supplies can be optimized for various situations. But um, if I'm designing an amplifier at a very high price point where the weight uh, is not going to be, or the weight or cost is not going to be an issue, it's probably still going to be a linear power supply. Makes sense. Um, uh, what piece were you involved with, uh, which you are most proud? Um, you know, again, I, every, every design is a unique experience. Um, I, I, you know, the, the phono for me was a, um, a really emotional project. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that went on in my life. Um, during that time. I, I designed that product in, in um, November 2017, so it was quite a, a long time ago. Um, and uh, a lot happened in my life. Um, I, I actually, I got divorced during that time and, and it was just horrible. I had a horrible experience and I had to drag myself back up. And um, there was a lot of, there are a lot of emotions in that product um, for me. Um, and, uh, and I spent so much time on it, so much time on it, like listening, uh, hundreds of hours of listening. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that one because I'm proud that I got back up and I, um, I picked myself back up from a very bad situation that I was in in my life. And so I'm proud, I'm proud for it for a personal reason. I'm not so interested in, in what other people think. I'm glad that they're enjoying it and it's bringing it's bringing them pleasure and that's what matters for me, but it's not a, I'm not looking for recognition in that. It's, it's more of a personal thing and it's something I want to accomplish. And I'm glad that I was able to accomplish it for myself. Good job. Um, uh, does, does Bascom uh, have a role at PS Audio these days? Uh, he absolutely does. Um, I work with him all the time. And I love Bascom. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, what a gentle, smart guy. Um, and he's taught me so much about circuits, so much about what matters for, for listening. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge. And, uh, and yes, we have him. I work very closely with him and we have some, we have a lot of plans for, for Bascom's products in the future. Cool. Um, Pete asks, uh, how does the M1200 design differ from the M700s? Um, well, to start, the, the M700 is an older uh, ice power design that's based around their dual uh, uh, feedback topology that they patented. And uh, the 1200 takes it a bit further with their new ice edge technology which further optimizes this feedback. And so it basically has more feedback. And this, um, this increases the load independence and uh, decreases distortion. Uh, it also has a um, power factor correction circuit on the input of the switch mode power supply. So 
that's pretty cool. At uh, max power, it, uh, its power factor is 0.9. So uh, that's pretty impressive. So you can actually pull a lot of power from the wall and uh, without uh, a lot of that power just being shifted into imaginary power because the current waveform is uh, out of phase with the voltage waveform. Um, so it keeps those waveforms in line and doing that it maximizes the power that you can pull from your wall. Um, for otherwise, it's it, the M700 is a MOSFET design. The, the 1200 is a, is a vacuum tube design. Um, I'm not necessarily that, you know, vacuum tubes are the best thing in the world. Uh, I don't know. I've heard great designs with almost everything made. Um, I talk to designers who, who are, I'm friends with designers who push tubes. I'm friends with designers who are, who are JPEG guys. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't categorize a single device. I'm probably going to use all types of devices. And some of my products have, have, have almost all of them, all devices other than GANs. I, I haven't used GANs before, but at least JFETs, MOSFETs, and vacuum tubes. I've certainly used um, almost all of them in a single product. So, so it's about the application for me. Um, but, uh, but the overall design in the M1200 results in a, in a more refined product that has less of the class D problems. So don't change my, don't trade in my M700 set quickly is what you're telling me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep reading the reviews and it's really pissing me off, man. I, I'm like, the the M700s what? are an awesome, they're an I awesome. They hit. are, I know they are, I got three of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kurt uh, asks, how does the ICE module you use compared to the new Purify? Um, I don't exactly know what Bruno is doing in the Purify, but I'll say uh, Purify has has better specifications on the output. Um, the the ice the ice is um, is better than the high pack stuff, the N core stuff. The Purify is is cutting edge um, and also unbelievably expensive. Um, there's no way I could have put that in the M1200, uh, and it's a lot less power too. Um, with no power supply. Um, so it was, uh, I haven't even listened to the Purify stuff. Um, I'm sure it's very good, uh, but it was, uh, the, the 1200 was from Ice Power was just uh, an obvious uh, go-to. I, I really like Ice a lot. Um, I've listened to a lot of the Hypex stuff um, and, uh, and, and I prefer Ice over them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm curious about the Purify. I, I think that it's probably the output stage is better, but remember it's the design. You have to, you have to have an input stage that matches that. You have to make something that's, that works. Um, but it, the specifications are very nice. And Bruno is a, you know, he's a very talented engineer. Um, Jeff uh, asks, uh, trusting your own ears is very, very valuable. Yes, absolutely. Um, are you uh, about 38 years old? I'm, I'm uh, 30, 32. Uh, trying to understand your frame of reference. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is daunting a little bit going into uh, this industry and um, you know, it's uh, design can take a long time to master audio design. Uh, you see a lot of the younger designers, it takes a long time to build up reputation. It takes a long time to get experience under your belt to, um, to be able to not mess up uh, because the environment when you're producing audio products can be, uh, there can be a lot of pressure and it can be something where you have to you know, perform very quickly and you can't make a mistake. Um, reliability, sound quality, uh, meeting the specifications of the design itself. So, so um, you know, it's, uh, it does take a long time uh, as far as experience goes. Um, you know, I'm fortunate. I think that I really have to 
I have a lot of gratitude towards Paul in putting me um, front and center and allowing me to design the products that I have. And, um, and for that, I have put everything I have into him. I, I spent so much time. I, I don't, I'm not a, a nine to five guy. I, I, I work all the time, weekends, I'm listening, I'm tweaking, I'm coming up with ideas. It's just a passion. If I, if I go, you know, hiking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about amplifiers, you know, I'm, you know, it's just a, it's just a passion. I love it. You know, I love doing stuff. I love, I love uh, hiking in the woods alone and just going off and trying to design something. That's kind of how I, how I work. And I feel refreshed after it. So it's, it's great. Um, so I'm just really thankful for, for Paul. He's done so much for me and I, I just wouldn't be in this situation without him. I, I, I wouldn't. Um, there, there are plenty, plenty of people to fill my, to fill my void, you know? Um, uh, yeah, Mola Mola, whew, you know, um, incredible, you know, I mean, you, you look at, I don't know, so, um, Mola Mola is a company that is, uh, uh, designed by uh, Bruno Putzis, um, who's the same guy that, that did Hypex and Purify. And uh, he is an objectivist, um, but you know, that's respectful um, as well, I'm not saying anything against that. Um, it's, uh, he, is in, he is a very talented engineer that's producing products that basically don't have any measurable distortion. Uh, which is a feat, and and uh, I, I commend him on it. It's basically he's using high amounts of feedback to achieve that. Um, stabilizing those designs means that you you really understand the nuances of feedback theory. So he really understands that stuff to make stable designs that have that much feedback. Um, whether it sounds good is is a is a subjective thing, and it depends who you ask, but. Um, but the designs themselves are very respectable and uh, I read everything he publishes and I think highly of him. Uh, <laughs> 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 What's it like working for an ego like Paul McGowan? Um, it is, it is never boring because because Paul, the guy that you read in his book, the Paul, the guy that you see on the YouTube video, that is Paul. That that's not that's not Paul like running a company. That's um that's like that's actually Paul. So so you never know what's around the corner. And you know some of that has to do with Arnie. Um, some of that is the Arnie culture, and a little bit how. Um, you know, they're just, uh, they're just characters. And I, I just love, I love Paul to death. And I, I loved Arnie too. Um, and, uh, you know, it's never boring. And he, he's taught me so much about everything. I mean, from, from circuit design to, um, to a company, to, to running a company. And, um, and he's, uh, I highly respect him. Do you see powered speakers as having an important place going forward? That's a really, really good question. And my answer is yes. Um, I, I, think that, I think that powered speakers are, are fantastic. It's, it's really where I see myself, um, you know, I, I definitely want to play in this field. Uh, and, and PS Audio, at PS Audio, we're really interested in it as well. Um, I think that the idea of a powered speaker resolves so many issues, especially from a um, synergy perspective. Uh, you get to take class Ds and you get to really implement them the way that they're meant to be implemented. And also not having a crossover and, and running a crossover um, actively before the class D is very, very good um, and can be done really, really well. Now, how that's implemented uh, will, is extremely important to how that design sounds and how it performs. So again, just because it's powered doesn't mean it's great. 
but um, but I think that there's a uh, the, the possibilities are endless with powered speakers, and I think that you're going to see more of them. I agree. <laughs> uh, what, what do you feel that a tube input stage does in your Stellar M1200 design? Um, so, you know, you, I think I touched on this a little bit. Um, it's hard to necessarily say that a certain device has a sound um, because there's so many variables. There's, there's usually resistors and capacitors around that device, whether it's a transistor or whether it's a, a tube. Um, and there's different uh, variables, uh, even past that with power supply. Uh, what's your power supply like? So a tube power supply that's 200 volts might be designed a little bit different than a uh, transistor power supply of 12 volts. You might have an IC regulator that has a 0.01% regulation, where the tube power supply might have like a 10% regulation or a 5% regulation. So those are gonna sound a little bit different. So, so I don't necessarily wanna say that, hey, tubes sound this way and transistors sound that way. But what I will say is that when you implement a tube correctly and you drive it into its very linear region, um, you use a current source uh, to bias it, um, to optimize its linearity. Um, people mess around with, uh, with active loads on them. Um, and then you put good components around that. Uh, a triode sounds really, really good. Um, and it doesn't necessarily color the music um, as much as people, you know, like say tubes color the music, if that makes sense. Um, it, a lot of the colorations are due to issues with the design and uh, in the passive components around it. So a lot of tube designs have, um, maybe they're not really operating in a very linear region. Maybe it's a, a tube power amp that has to swing and slew a lo lots of volts and then then you have an output transformer. So there's all these variables that contribute to the sound. So what the M1200 uh, input stage brings to the M1200 uh, is a, um, a musically transparent perspective of the whole amplifier as a whole. Um, it's exactly what I needed to have in that input stage to almost inverse the sound of the, of the output stage. Um, I found that the, the M700 input stage, while pretty much did the same thing, doesn't sound as transparent. It doesn't have as much realness and you're there kind of sound as a triode with no you know, loop feedback and just um, degenerated sounds like. Uh, triodes can just sound really like right when they're designed correctly. Um, Audio research is a really good example of that. Um, when you know a good audio research phone stage or line stage, it, William Johnson really knew how to optimize tubes uh, linearity, and uh, you kind of hear that in those in those designs. <laughs> 